All right, so today's presentation is called The Guide to Collecting Meteorites. This is um, my this is uh, my interpretation, things I've learned over 35 years of collecting meteorites, starting in 1985. And I left Rhode Island because my wife had plans to move to Florida and I became part of the plan. <laughs> so um, one thing I want to mention is all the... Uh, photos in the uh in this presentation are actually from my personal collection i photographed uh my meteorites rather than just pulling up from the internet okay so meteorites i can't see myself here uh so oh there i am okay good so meteorites Aliens from space. Why collect meteorites? Meteorites are extraterrestrial aliens. They are not of this earth, and they mean us no harm, Mr. Spock. <laughs> um, and um, if you look here, uh, this is your canonical alien. You know, this is from Alienware Computers. And if you look at one of my meteorites here, doesn't that look like an alien? Here's the eyes. See, and it has the elongated face, <laughs> <laughs> right? So it kind of, kind of looks like this alien wear alien. And what, and what's neat is uh, meteorites have proper names given by a nomenclature committee, and this one is called vaca moreta, and uh, in Spanish that means cow dead. So this is officially the cow dead meteorite, <laughs> the dead cow meteorite. <laughs> But I have no idea why they named it that because it was found in the Atacama Desert in Chile where there aren't any cows, but that is the official name. <laughs> and this is a, a must-have meteorite. Everyone needs a dead cow in their home. So <laughs> uh, most arrive quietly and others explosively. I'll show you some, uh, talk about the ones that arrive explosively later. Another thing, a uh, big myth is meteorites do not glow and are not radioactive. You see... Uh, B-grade science movies or a meteorite lands, and then it's glowing and it's pulsating. Mm. You get that sound effect, right? And then it breaks open and the aliens come out and invade the Earth, right? Well, nothing can be further from the truth, okay? They don't glow. They're not radioactive. They don't make sounds and stuff. But um, they're really fascinating. And uh, meteorites are cosmic fossils. They preserve information about the formation of the solar system 4.5 uh, billion years ago. So they're very important to science. Okay, so the appeal of meteorites. To me, it's a piece of the universe you can hold in your hand. And you can actually hold a solid piece of, of an asteroid, a portion of the asteroid. And astronomers typically collect photons, okay, which are ethereal. Skyscrapers recently had an astrophotography contest during uh, astro assembly, and that's what we were doing. We were collecting photons and, you know, processing them digitally. But here, space becomes rock solid, you know, and adds another dimension to rock counting, space rocks, collecting space rocks. Okay, um, meteorites, shattered asteroids, there's small bodies in the solar system. So I, as you know, between Mars and Jupiter, there's an asteroid belt. And this is kind of, it's mostly empty space, okay, here. It looks very full, but it's mostly empty space. And um, the asteroids are made out of rock, metal, or a mixture of the two. And this is fascinating because uh, the first time scientists have ever seen an asteroid was on October 29, 1991, when uh, the Galileo spacecraft going to Jupiter flew by asteroid Gasper. So before 91, no one had a clue what an asteroid really looked like. So isn't that fascinating? So it's kind of a, it's only been in the last 30 years or so that we've known what asteroids look like. Okay, so important definitions. Meteor, the light phenomenon or shooting star. So when, when you're observing the Perseid meteor showers uh, in next week, that's a meteor. A meteorite is when it makes it to the ground and you can actually pick it up and hold it in your hand. Um, now, there's two types of, uh, there's what are called falls and finds. And these are just like the 
definition says. A fall is a witness than recorded event. You actually saw the meteorite fall. You ran right away, picked it up. Okay, so those are the most valuable. Uh, find was discovered um, after they make it to the ground. Okay, and um, okay. find is discovered after they make it to the ground. So you. Um, so you're hunting for meteorites and you find it. You never saw it fall. It could be there for thousands of years. Uh, fusion crust is the burnt outer coating, which is evidence of atmospheric entry. So when you look at a meteorite, they usually appear very black. And this is a uh, fusion crust, okay? And we'll talk more about fusion crust later. And a strewn field is the area where uh, meteorites from a single fall are dispersed, okay? So this is where you want to look for a known meteorite fall. Uh, classifications. Three, if you remember anything from this lecture, it's stones, irons, and stony irons. It's that simple, okay? You, it, everyone's been to museums and uh, you, you always see iron meteorites, okay? Those only comprise 6% of all meteorites. Most of them are the stone, stony type of meteorites like this. And uh, when I first started collecting, I collected mostly the irons. And then I started falling in love with the stones. And the stony meteorites actually tell a lot more about the formation of the solar system scientifically than the irons or the stony irons, okay? And um, if you look at this uh, stone here, this is um, what's called an ordinary chondrite. We'll talk more about this later. But this is what's called a breccia. You see class here, this one two, three, four, five, and thinner one there, six. So those are six separate rocks that that got uh, smashed together and the heat of impact caused them to coalesce and kind of become a single rock. So that's called a breccia or bracia. Okay, and then uh, the irons, um, the most common is called an octahedrite. I'll talk about the other ones in a bit. But the octahedrites are the most common irons. And, and when you slice it and polish it, and then you etch it with nitric acid, you get this crisscross pattern called the Widmanstatin or Widmanstatin pattern. And uh, this is due to uh, varying amounts of nickel. The uh, darker ones are, uh, Tayanite and the lighter ones that came aside. So you get these um, crisscross thing and, and you can't reproduce this in a laboratory. Uh, you can't fake this. If you were to melt this meteorite, scientists have done that and then polished and etched it again, the Woodman Stanton pattern is gone. Okay, so it takes millions of years of slow cooling in the core of an asteroid to form this. Okay, and then the stony irons are the prettiest. This is called the palisite. And uh, this one is uh, Brenham. This one actually found in uh, Kansas. And you have olivine, which is a uh, gem grade peridot within a nickel iron matrix. And if you etch this, it will, um, with nitric acid, you'll get a Widmanstatin pattern here, but it's usually not done because it can destroy the uh, olivine crystals. Okay, classification stones. Uh, stones are the. Uh, Stones are the crust or outer surface of an asteroid. Two types, chondrites and achondrites, A meaning not. So this is what a chondral is, a small spherical body formed by remelting of mineral grains in the solar nebula. So see all these round things here? Aren't they beautiful? That looks very exotic. Doesn't look like any moon rock here, okay, on Earth. Those are chondrules, okay? And this is a fall, fell February 28, 1857 in India, Parnali. It's an LL3, and uh, it's an ordinary chondrite. And uh, ordinary con uh, chondrites come in three varieties, H, L, and LL, high metal, low metal, and low, low metal. Okay. And then uh, here you have an achondrite. This one's called the Howardite. Okay, and this was found in 2001 in the Morocco. And then uh, rarer stones, achondrites. So the, the, the three types of achondrites that are the most common are, um, are um, the... Uh, 
Howardites, Eucrites, and Diogenites, called the HED meteorites, okay? There's also Aubrites, Uralites, and then these are a lot rarer, okay? But these are uh, Eucrite, and this is a Diogenite. And what's uh, great about the, these meteorites is the fact that they've been confirmed to come from asteroid Vesta, from one asteroid, okay? Asteroid Vesta is the second largest asteroid in the uh, in the asteroid belt. And uh, we know that because if you look at this uh, graph here, the solid lines are crushed up, powdered uh, meteorite, breaks my heart. And then these are my uh, specimens here. The author of Meteorite Magazine put this together. And, uh, and the circles are reflected, uh, uh, reflection from the uh, from the asteroid and if you look you have a uh, pyroxene which is the major mineral here has an absorption band of 0 0.93 here and 1.97 and so that uh shows um that these uh, and look at the spectra look at that nice match okay so the all these three come from that one meteorite and I mean, this one asteroid, and this is called a snowman, C123. <laughs> Being up north, you'd appreciate that, those three craters there. And uh, and this is my personal joke. They, they, they call this the pyroxene dip. It tastes great on cheese and crackers. My wife loves cheese and cracker cheese every day. <laughs> so it sounds like the pyroxene dip. Okay, so next. Um, stones rarer types enstatite chondrites okay these come in h and l varieties high metal and low metal varieties these are pretty rare it's pretty hard to get and uh primary minerals are enstatite low iron olefine and uh and it, look at those beautiful chondrules there see so that's an h3 that is three through six three means well-preserved chondrules, and six means the chondrules have kind of melted away, and you don't really see them not very well defined. So that, that's the way they classify. Okay, and then um, the carbonaceous chondrites, which is one of my personal favorites, and um, the carbonaceous chondrites are um, uh, are from a um, a type specimen. CI stands for uh, Ivuna, K for Corunda, M for Magai, O for Organs, R for Renzano, and V for Rig uh, Vigorano. And uh, these contain carbon, higher amount of carbon than most meteorites. And they contain what's called organic carbon, which is carbon uh, bonded to uh, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen, C-H-O-N. And I'll talk more about this later. And then these are Rudy, which are um, pretty rare. So these are the, these are basically the rarer types of, um, of meteorites here. Uh, classification, iron. Iron are the cores of a parent body. They're composed entirely of iron and nickel. And there's three types, the octahedrites, the hexahedrites, and the ataxites. I mentioned the octahedrites. They have that beautiful crisscross pattern. They're the only ones that do. The ataxites have the highest amount of nickel, and they do not edge. So if you were to polish them and add nitric acid, It'll just be a nice mirror surface, it won't etch. The hexahedrites um, form lines that are called Newman lines through it, and that's it. So only the octahedrites form that beautiful, um, that beautiful crisscross pattern. And then there's, uh, then there's coarse, cor there's coarsest, coarse, medium, fine, and finest octahedrites based on the thickness of that crisscross Rittenstein pattern. And here, uh, th this is a must-have uh, in everyone's collection. Um, the uh, what's called a sicodialine. This this was actually seen to fall. This was one of the very few iron meteorites that was seen to fall on February 12, 1947. And this one is kind of unique because it has two types, what's called a shrapnel type and what's called a regmoglyph or thumbprint type. And regmoglyphs are, if you can see here, as little your your thumbs will fit in here, so they call them thumbprints. And that's where as it came through the atmosphere, it'll blade it away. And this one actually formed your crater in uh, Arizona, if you've ever been to that, haven't put it on your bucket. It's really worth seeing. 
and um, and there's a stamp that's commemorating this. There was an artist at the time painting the scenery here, and he saw this, and he painted this for memory. So this is so I have this stamp, and uh, it's it's a pretty famous uh, portrait of uh, how the uh, meteorite fall looked like. And there's uh, tons of this stuff that fell too. So it's it's not uh, it's readily available. Okay, and when you see um, and when you see uh, iron meteorites, you'll see this uh, funky number like two B, one A B, and all that. What that means is, um, you know, it's authentic when you see that number. What it means is the amount you you graph nickel versus trace elements like iridium, gallium, and germanium, and they they group in different parts in the graph, and then they call that one A. To AP and all that stuff. So that, that's where that number comes from. Okay. Um, stony irons form the mantle of a parent body. They uh, uh, meteoriticists call asteroids parent bodies. Okay. Uh, they, they are a mixture of stone and metal. Okay. And then palisites, these are the these are the most beautiful of all. This, the, I call them the supermodels of the meteoritic world. And they have equal amounts of nickel iron and olivine. This is olivine, which is gem grade peridot. Okay. And then mesosiderites, which are composed of silicate, nickel iron, and eucrite inclusion. And here's our famous dead cow again, which is a mesosiderite stony iron. Okay. And uh, this is readily available on, on eBay. I'll talk about Okay, so putting it all together, so stone meteorites represent the crust of of, uh, of a parent body. So, so think of it: you're between two two major uh, planets, Jupiter and Mars. And Jupiter is huge. You can think of uh, all the mass of the solar system is basically in two objects: the Sun and in Jupiter. So, so between Jupiter and Mars a planet could not form because of the intense gravity of Jupiter it would keep it from from coalescing okay so you have uh the crust of a of a parent body of a planet that never formed you have the core the iron meteorites and the stony irons represent the mantle so see how it all fits together okay now journey to an asteroid this is really cool um NASA's Dawn mission in 2011 actually visited and mapped two asteroids. The, uh, the largest asteroid is Cirrus, which is about 580 miles across. And then the other, uh, and then it, first they were actually went to Vesta and then to Cirrus. And Vesta is about 350 or so miles across. So these are huge. And over 50% of the mass of the asteroid belt is in this one asteroid. Isn't that amazing? So <laughs> these were really significant here, and um, and it was Matt, and they and they confirmed that the HED, remember the Howardite, Eucrite, Diogenite meteorites are indeed from asteroid Vesta. Okay, this one, and uh, right now uh, NASA has. Uh, the OSIRIS-REx mission, this is an acronym, they mapped and successfully collected a sample from this carbon-rich asteroid called Bennu, okay, which is a carbonaceous chondrite, which is like this, okay, and um, they collected it recently on October 20, 2020, and it's going to be heading back to the Earth in a few months, and it should arrive in 2023, and um, What's cool about this mission is, is you can go on YouTube and see how it actually it actually touched down, ejected uh, nitrogen and sucked up. And they were only expecting to get 60 grams, which is two ounces of uh, material. And the container could fit four pounds. And the container was so full, it's actually spitting out excess, uh, excess um, asteroid dust yeah. and powder. Isn't that amazing? So they probably got closer to four pounds. So it was even more successful than we thought. And then, um, and then Japan, before I sent out a uh, probe called Hayabusa, which means falcon in Japanese, the Hayabusa mission. And Hayabusa 1 went um, to this asteroid. It's 
Itakawa, and this ended up being an ordinary chondra and brought back a, a sample of that. And it happened to be an LL, low, low metal. Isn't that cool? And then um, the Hayabusa 2 successfully mapped the, this carbon with Jester in Ryugu in 2018. And guess what? It, the sample is returning tomorrow, December 6, 2020. I saw on YouTube they have in live feeds JAXA, which is the NASA of uh, Japan, is uh, having a live feed for the sample return mission from Hayabusa 2. Isn't that amazing? So we're going to have an asteroid. The first time we're going to have an asteroid, a sample from an asteroid turned to Earth. And then there's a, a mission plan call for a metal asteroid, 16 Psyche. Can you believe that? It's going to be launched August 22 and should map the asteroid by 2026. And this is a model based on radar observations. But uh, this is actual metal asteroid. And I read papers on this. They believe it's a mesosiderite like a dead cow. Okay, and others believe it's closer to a palisite, others more of an iron. So there's different parts of it that can be different different things. So th this is going to be really exciting to actually see a metal asteroid. No one's ever seen that before. So, and then, of course, meteorites are the poor man's space probe. They arrive to Earth free of charge. <laughs> it takes great genius and, and uh, billions of dollars to design these spacecraft and to go to these asteroids and map them and collect um, samples, but meteorites come to us free of charge. Okay, so now um, collecting meteorites, pricing. So you want to start a collection. So now you know basically the three basic types, stones, iron, stony irons, chondrites, achondrites, octahedrites, um, hexahedrites, and ataxite. I only have two octahedrites hexahedrites and two ataxites in my collection. They're very hard to get, okay? Octahedrites you're gonna find. So that's, so just focus on that. And then palisites and mesosiderites, okay? So meteorites are named after the locality after which they were found. So there's an official nomenclature committee that actually, um, you know, um, decides what the name is gonna be. They're sold by the gram. Grams a very small amount, but think of it this way. One ounce is 28.35 grams. So just round this off to 30. So if you, if you have a 30 gram piece, you have a little more than an ounce of meteorite, okay? Um, so when purchasing a meteorite, take the cost and divide it by the total weight of the specimen to attain the cost per gram. For example, if you see a $50 specimen on eBay, Always check the weight. The weight is 10 grams. Divide 50 by 10, it's $5 per gram, okay? So that's how you figure out. So always find out what the cost per gram because you'll have the total cost of the meteorite. Find out how many grams and divide the two and get the cost per gram. Shop around because dealer prices really vary. Okay? I've seen, um, I, I've seen, uh, things really vary. Uh, for example, one meteorite, I'll show you a yen day, which was the very first cover slide. That's going for 15 to $25 a gram, which is, which is uh, a decent price considering its rarity. And one dealer had it for $50 a gram. So he had to double the price, see, so shop around. So ordinary chondrites typically average five to $10 per gram, whereas achondrites can average between 10 to $20 a gram or or depending on the rarity. Remember, the achondrites are the HEs, eubrites, diogenites, howardites. Um, irons are priced cheaper, typically 50 cents to $2 per gram or more. Palisites are expensive, uh, supermodels. They're $30, $30 plus per gram. I, I bought mine at four to $5 a gram many years ago. They've... But there's one that's $5 a gram, the Brenham which is from Kansas. So get that one, okay? That one is still very reasonable. But any, one, any other one is very expensive. And mesosiderites, our dead cow is about $5 a gram too. So those, around five, ten dollars $10 a gram is pretty reasonable. Now you have lunar and Martian meteorites, and I'll talk about these. And these are, these are priced at several hundred to $1,000 a gram. So these are very expensive. So stay away from the more exotic, expensive stuff till you get 
into this and, and know what you're doing. And then December 2020, I just checked this afternoon, the average cost of gold is $59 per gram and silver $78 a gram. So many, many meteorites are worth much more than this per gram, the rarer types, okay? And then meteorites appreciate in value but don't invest all your money in meteorites, stocks, bonds, mutual funds, et cetera, are a much better long-term uh, strategy, investment strategy. Okay, so another thing you wanna look at when you purchase a meteorite is what's known as a total known weight. How much meteorite actually is on the earth, is known, has been collected thus far. And sometimes you only have a single stone that's collected and it's cut up for museums and collectors. And sometimes you have many individuals, okay? Averaging pounds to over a ton. So here's an example. The Zagami sugar type, this landed October 3rd, 1962, weighs 40.1 pounds, okay? So there's only one stone of this on the whole planet, okay? That fell in Nigeria, Africa and weighs 40.1 pounds. And one collector, Robert Haig, ended up uh, uh, collecting 3.5 pounds. And uh, Kevin Kachinka actually held this in his hand at, at his vault in uh, Arizona. And uh, this was cut up for everybody else. So if you ever buy Zagami, it all came from uh, this piece Robert Haig uh, negotiated with the museum in Nigeria. Now the bottom one, Allende, CV3, this is a very rare type of carbonaceous chondrite. Okay, I'll talk more about this later. This is my largest piece, 161.3 grams. And this is fusion crust here, see it? Then here the fusion crust are bladed away and you can see the interior structure, right? So that's fusion crust now, out of coating. Okay, so the, the point I'm trying to make here is many individuals totally for two tons. So here we have one single 40 pound stone of Zagami, and here we have 4,000 pounds of Allende, with literally thousands of, of individual fragments scattered all over the place, okay? So you can tell that this would be very expensive, and that will be less expensive because there's more of it, okay? So always look at the total known weight. That's very, that's very important. Okay, collecting meteorites. This is some of the lingo. So uh, you'll see on the websites that they're selling an individual, an end piece, or a slice. An individual is just a complete specimen, okay? Just the, the complete box. So instead of saying, they call it an individual, okay? Uh, an end piece is when it's cut in half or quarters. So this is an end piece here. See it? It's cut in half. So the other half will be here. All right, so this is an end piece, okay? And then a slice is um, like right here, okay? So that's a slice, all right? And then slices can be complete or partial. And uh, here, here's what I mean by, this is a complete slice, look at that. See, it's beautiful, you have the fusion crust all the way around. This is a partial slice, okay, and you can see, these saw marks here and then you'd have one here and then another piece here so this would have this is one third so it, um, dealers like to cut meteorites because they get more money right this see this could be cut in half or could cut like this and they can get a lot more money selling each piece and stay away from these sometimes you see perfectly square cuts like this i really hate that or oh, it could be more rectangular but i hate that doesn't that look synthetic does that look like a real meteorite to you not really but you look at this yeah even though it's a partial slice you could tell see this is the natural edge you see the fusion cross see the beautiful uh, Whitman Staten pattern. This is called the finest octahedrite, okay? 4A class, okay? So try to get a complete slice if you can. If not, get a partial, but stay away from this. And I have a few square pieces of some very rare enstatite uh, chondrites like this. And, you know, it just ruins the whole aesthetics of it. Okay, meteoritic slices, the best bang for your buck. Uh, surface area is a measure of the total area that 
the surface of an object. So when purchasing a meteorite, look at the total cost of the specimen, the price per gram, and the dimensions. This is critical. Look at the dimensions. Try to get one with the largest surface area, okay? And here's two uh, meteorites here. Uh, this, is a, this is an albright here, a chondrite. And actually, this is an albright here too. But look how, this is a, a fine. Look how weathered this is, okay? This, this is terrible, okay? And then this is what that should be if it were a fall. Isn't that beautiful, see? So they really weather, okay? And then this one is Holbrook, which is uh, another fall. So these two are falls. And notice they're about the same size, okay? When you hold them together like this. But notice the thickness, see? Oh, well, let me get it. See how the, the Albright, this is a lot thicker than this. A little hard to tell, but it's thicker. The, the, uh, notice how much bigger surface area this has. See, and a good size is one that you can hold in the palm of your hand like that. See, that's a good size. But this is a lot smaller, right? And notice the Albright, which is thicker, it actually weighs less, 25.8 and it's smaller, and this one weighs 67.6, .6, which is 30 times two, this is over two ounces, and it weighs a lot more, but notice the surface area, it's a lot bigger, see? So, so look for that, make sure you get, you know, the largest surface area you can. See, and you can actually fit like three meteorites here, like there, one here. So it's, um. So the surface areas, the dimensions are an important thing to look at. You want to maximize how large it is. Okay, fusion crust. I mentioned that the burnt outer coating, evidence of atmospheric entry. So fusion crust can be rather weathered. So fines uh, also include the date found, okay? So don't get confused if you see a date. The fines will always have the exact date, March 5th, 1960. Here they'll just say found the year or maybe the month in the year. But notice, see, here the fusion crust is very weathered. Here it's kind of intermediate. And here it's jet black. So there's very weathered fusion crust, as you can see here. This is and NWA869. I'll talk about this meteorite. It's kind of intermediate. It's not bad. And then this one is Wan Chen's. This is landed in China in in uh, February 15, uh, 1997. So this is a fall too, see? So you get this beautiful jet black fusion crust. So falls are really desirable by collectors. Okay, fusion crust, uh, present or absent. So try to get a piece that has fusion crust on it. Not, not all pieces will have it. So here's the fusion crust here. And my piece of Zagami here, see, doesn't have fusion crust. And note something too, fusion crust does not penetrate deep in the interior of a meteorite because it's coming through the atmosphere very quickly. It's cold soaked, so it doesn't have much time to really penetrate it. And notice the fusion crust isn't like this thick way down here. Very, very thin piece, very, very thin strip. Uh, meteorite labels. Uh, proper labeling is essential. A label is more important than the meteorite specimen. If you purchase a meteorite without any documentation, it's worthless to a collector. All you know is you have some type of stone or iron, but where is it from, the locality, the fall? Uh, there was one uh, elderly gentleman in one of my astronomy clubs up in Tampa, and uh, he passed away a few years ago, and he had a few meteorites, irons, and uh, he showed them to me, and I asked him, well, what I, he didn't know the names. And when he passed away, they, they put his uh, collection for sale, and everyone thought, oh, Greg's going to grab these, and I didn't want them. And everyone was shocked. Why don't you want? It? There's no label. I don't know what the what the what the locality is. Okay, what the name of the meteorite is. So it's worthless to me. So somebody, so other people bought them because you know they had an authentic iron meteorite. But you know, if you don't have any labeling, it's really worthless to a collector. And here's uh, the labeling. There's this cool uh, website, meteoritelabels.com, and these are aluminum labels, and um, 
they're really cool. See the bats aluminum, and uh, they have for a lot of the more common meteorites that you can buy. And then these are labels that I make myself: uh, meteorite stone, olivine hypersteen chondrite. If it's an L. It's olivine hypersteen, which is the minerals. If it's H, it's olivine bronzite. And if it's LL, they call them an amphoterite. And this one is called Mox, which, uh, guess where it's from? Transylvania, Romania. This is the Dracula meteorite. That's what it's called, the Dracula meteorite. And notice the total known weight, 300 kilograms. 2.2 pounds is a, 2.2 uh, pounds is one kilogram. So multiply this by 2.2 to get pounds. So you're talking uh, 600 pounds and the 0.2 adds up. So maybe about 700 pounds of this meteorite. So it's quite a bit of it. And notice it's a full slice. You got this beautiful fusion crust all around. This is called slick and slide, there, which is fusion crust too. But notice this one has cancer. Um, you see here, this is the nice matrix and, and the iron, there's iron in here. I don't know if you can see it but in the light, but see there, there's iron flakes in these meteorites and see, pretty, it's pretty magnetic. And uh, these iron meteor, this iron flakes tend to rust and they'll stay in the matrix, okay? So I'll talk about how to prevent that in a bit. And then this is was a museum trade, and this this was the museum label that came with it. My this specimen is 17.9. It is a 73. This was the collector's uh, label. He thought I might want a copy of the label, and that was nice of them. Okay, so putting it all together, when purchasing a meteorite, look at the specimen type with label. Is it a fall or find? How available is it? How rare is it? Any fusion crust? What's the total known weight? Is it aesthetic? Is it this perfectly square synthetic piece or is this beautiful, you know, complete, complete slice? Total cost of the specimen, price per gram and dimensions, and try to maximize surface area if possible, okay? So this is what you want to look at when you're purchasing a meteorite. And it took me 35 years to figure this out. <laughs> Okay, um, starting a meteorite collection, internet sources. Uh, eBay is a good place to start. Okay, and to know that it's an authentic, look look uh, on the on the page, and it'll say, look for an IMCA number, which stands for International Meteorite Collectors Association. These are authentic meteorite dealers that deal exclusively in high-end meteorites. So you know you're not getting ripped off by anything fake. And you know it's fake if a meteorite is $300,000 or $1 million, right? They're, they're not worth that much, okay? So, you know, anything outrageous like that, is not going to be. And then they won't even look like a meteorite too, once you know really what meteorites look like. And then these two show individual meteorite collectors web pages. Okay. So you can check out individual collectors. Most of them tend to put them on eBay these days. And then academic, there's this free online magazine, Meteorite Times. Okay. And, uh, Kevin Kachinka and I have published uh, numerous articles here and, and in Meteorite Magazine. So this is online. You can download it. It's per absolutely free. This is an excellent website, meteoritestudies.com. Very academic. Gives you a lot of science. Th this website here, Meteoritical Society, you type in a name of a meteorite and it'll tell you if it's official. So you type in, you know, um, Vaca Mareta, dead cow, and it will show you, you know, all the science um, and everything. And then here you can, this will search for uh, periodic, uh, periodicals, research articles. Okay, so collecting meteorites. So there's, um, there's uh, what's called a type collector, uh, Witness false historic specimens, aesthetic shapes, scientific signature, and thin section. You can also purchase, I have a collection of these. Um, where is it here? There it is. Microscope slides. These are thin sections. The, the, these are uh, meteorites that are sliced thinner than a human hair, 35 microns. And uh, 
And then you can see these under the microscope and I'll show you some photos of that later. So you, you can do a whole collection of thin sections too. Okay, so what is a type collector? Um, three main types of meteorites, remember stones, iron, stony irons. So begin by purchasing one representative sample of each class or subclass. And as time goes on, the experienced enthusiast begins to specialize and ultimately focus on one or two areas of collecting that holds particular fascination. Like some people will like to, uh, to collect only falls, okay, because they look very, uh, pristine as opposed to fines. Other people like uh, my passion is carbonaceous chondroids, and I'll talk more about that in a bit. Other people like palisites. So people kind of tend to focus on one little niche area. They have a whole variety, one representative sample of all the types, but then they really focus in on a certain subtype. And then here, you have a uh, type. So if you think it's only stones, irons, and stony irons, think again. You have, remember, chondrites and achondrites. So in the chondrites, is the carbonaceous, ordinary, is rudimudi, and enstatite. And in the carbonaceous, there's the type specimen. And then in the ordinary, there's H, L, and LL, high, low, and low, low metal. And then H, and then there's three through six. So there's actually 12, H3, H4, H5, H6, L3, L4, L5, L3. Yeah. So I, I have one of each of these. And the LL4 took me the longest time to find. Um, and then the enstatite's the same thing, three through six. But these are so rare, I don't have the complete set of these. And then um, achondrites. These are pretty rare here. And then the achondrites, the HED, remember the Euclid, diagonite, howardites that are from asteroid Vesta, albrights, which is this beautiful one here, and then uralites, angroids. And then you have Martian and you have lunar meteorites too. And I'll talk a little about this in a bit. Okay, so collecting meteorites, witnessed falls. A lot of people will collect falls because falls are really are really great. And here's an example of a strewn field. Look at this. See how the meteorites fell? All these little uh, dots here, colored dots are where no meteorites have fell. And then this one fell in a residential area. March 26, 2003, Park Forest in uh, Illinois, Indiana. And um, and then here's a specimen I, I bought actually from Steve Arnold, one of the meteorite men. And oh, there, there's an excellent series, Meteorite Men, and it's available on YouTube. The whole series is on there. Uh, I think it was three seasons or so. And they go into strewn fields and they hunt for more meteorites and they actually find more, you know? So it's really cool. And it shows the excitement of finding a, a meteorite. And notice this is a partial slice because notice this is a uh, saw mark here and there was another piece here. So that would have been a full slice there. So this is a partial slice, but, but that's pretty. And notice the price too. Uh, this is 3.6 gram, $30 a gram. What did I say ordinary chondrites go for? Five to ten dollars. I'm paying six times the price of five bucks. Okay, why? Because it's a witness fall and it has a story associated with it. And the documentation. This one hit 177 Winslow Street, the address of Dale and Diana Casco. Okay. So this is how specific and detailed. Um, meteorite collectors and scientists want to be when they collect these things, okay? So that's why when when my friend, you know, had these meteorites and he didn't know the names, I didn't, because, you know, look at this detail, okay? The, the, the label is more important than the specimen. You really need to, to have everything well documented. And then collecting meteorites, historic specimen, Chilimbisk. I think everyone's heard of this. This was a historic fall. fall. The Park Forest also qualifies as a historic. But this fell February 15, 2013 in Russia. And uh, there were um, car, uh, cars had webcam uh, dash cams that were um, uh, seeing the 
and and different people, no matter where they were, saw this entering at different angles. And scientists were actually able to triangulate where in the asteroid belt this originated from. And this is how it looked. And and people thought that that they were being bombed by a, uh, by a missile because what happened is it was really bright. You saw this this. Uh, dust tail and then you heard a shock wave and it shattered windows damaged 7200 buildings and left 1500 people injured and and you you could check youtube there's people with glass in their face because a lot of people ran to hear the noise and then the window just blew in <laughs> on exploded in on them so it's amazing no one died but 1500 were injured many had to go to the hospital for stitches it was really something you know and uh the resulting fragments were scattered over a wide area and the largest look at that 1442 pounds uh was raised from the bottom of a lake and uh, one of the meteorite dealers here actually a lot of meteorite dealers went and got collected specimens and here's how they look like look at that that black fusion crust and the inside is so beautiful look at that it has a whitish matrix okay and then he also uh gave me a glass glass fragment from the garden shed of dennis karputkin can you believe that so this is so this is from the glass set of the shed of this individual that was shattered by this by the shock wave of this meteorite isn't that amazing so and then wo stands for weathering state zero to five and that's zero means it's not weather and s4 means shock same thing one to four or five so this is highly shock okay so they have even more divisions now okay collecting meteorites aesthetic shapes um one other thing this is my largest meteorite here this is a uh, campo di cielo am i pronouncing that kevin how is that pronounced in spanish campo, field of the sky um and this is, look at this, 50,000 kilograms times 2.2. .2, that's over 100,000 pounds. So this one is readily available on eBay and it's very reasonably priced, okay? You could get some of these for 20, a small piece for $25, $50. So this is very, really worth getting, okay? And uh, this one weighs 31 pounds. And then scientific significance. So meteorites have interesting stories to tell. Falls are the most valuable to science. Uh, uh, meteorite fall is pristine, has not been terrestrialized through time. This is what I mean by terrestrialized. Look how, look how uh, weathered that is. You can barely tell that's a meteorite, okay? And then uh, even meteoritic finds have scientific value if they're confirmed to be from the moon of the planet Mars. Okay, so scientific significance. Allende. This is um, this fell February 8, 1969, in Chihuahua State, Mexico. Over two tons, like I said. And what makes this meteorite um, special is this meteorite and another one I'll mention, Murchison. There have been over a hundred thousand articles, primary literature research articles, written on this meteorite alone. Okay, that's how important scientifically this meteorite is. And this is really something everyone should have in their in their collection. Okay. And and this now I've seen it on eBay, goes for fifteen to twenty-five dollars a gram. Okay. So buy a uh, four gram, five gram piece, and believe me, you won't regret it. This is such a beautiful meteorite. And then, see the, these right here? These are called calcium aluminum inclusions. These are uh, the first silicate to have formed in the solar nebula. And you get, look at all these other uh, chondrules here. And what's cool is it contains carbon, since it's a carbonaceous chondrite, in the form of graphite, diamond, and fullerene. Okay, there's diamonds in this guy. And the graphite is uh, carbon bonded to itself in a tetrahedral kind of shape. So it slides over as graphite is a lubricant. Diamond is a tetrahedral shape, so it's like a tripod. And, um, and the, but they're nano diamonds, they're 10 to the negative nine meters. <laughs> they're not huge diamonds, you're not gonna get, you know, chunk-sized diamonds out of this, they're nano diamonds. And then fullerene is the third form of carbon which is carbon bonded C60, bonded as, as like a soccer ball, as a hexagon and a pentagon. 
<coughs> and C70 as a rugby ball. So this is a third form of carbon, only discovered in the mid 80s. Isn't that amazing? So these are the three forms of carbon. When I went to school, there are two forms of carbon, graphite and diamond, now there's three. Okay, and now organic carbon is carbon bonded to hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen. It can also be bonded to sulfur and phosphorus, but that's where most of it is hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. And uh, I, I just published an article in Meteorite Times Magazine, the November issue, which is the most current one. The scientists have actually discovered an amino acid, which is a building block of proteins, glycine, the simplest one, a protein composed entirely of glycine. Isn't that amazing? We call it hemolyphin. And um, we read the article and, and it's really fascinating. It contains stardust, silicon carbide, and this stardust uh, formed due to a nearby exploding supernova that could have started the collapse of our solar nebula to form the solar system. Isn't that neat? So we have remnants of a, of a of a supernova in the sky. <laughs> and then the elemental composition matches that of the sun. So all the heavier elements match what's in here. So that is that is really amazing. So this is, and I can go on and on. I have whole lectures on, on just, uh, I have a lecture of the carbon and carbonaceous chondroids. If you want to hear that, it's some, that's all I talk about. It's two meteorites. And then um, here, this is the Murchison. This fell September 28, 1969. This is a CM2. That's what this current one that fell um, August 23rd, 2019 in Costa Rica, uh, the same type. And, and this one, uh, similar findings to Allende, but this one's the one that contains the uh, amino acids, fatty acids, sugars, and nucleotides. What's cool about this is it, it has 96 amino acids in there and contains all the amino acids found in our body, okay? Has fatty acids, which form, uh, which form um, cell membranes, fatty acids form cell membranes. Sugars provide energy and nucleotides form DNA, uh, adenine, guanine, cytosine, thymine, and uracil. So uh, DNA and RNA, and they also found phosphorus in here too, which forms the backbone. So, so you have all the basic ingredients to form life in this one meteorite. Isn't that cool? So, that, so that's the theory a lot of scientists are looking at, what they call panspermia, where, you know, life started by, was, the earth was seeded by a lot of these carbonaceous chondrites. And actually, most um, of the uh, asteroids that we've been able to detect are of the carbonaceous chondrite type, but, carbon but they don't make it to Earth because they're a lot more fragile. And so um, I don't keep it in this, in this container for nothing because this is fragile if you too much. It'll just crumble. So you have to be careful. So uh, the... These two meteorites are really fantastic. And uh, this, uh, the year was 1969. The year 1969 was a really great year. Uh, the Allende meteorite fell February 8th. The Murchison meteorite fell September 28th. We landed on the moon on July 20th, 1969. And then there was the Woodstock Music Festival, Peace Man, <laughs> on August 15th. And I play acoustic guitar, so I love the uh, music of this time period. But this is my own personal joke. I didn't find this on the net. I noticed that night all these things happened in 69, so I made a nice little uh, cute little joke about it. <laughs> so scientific significance, the Mars rock. So I kept mentioning Zagami all the time. So what's so special about Zagami? It's a rock from Mars. That's what's cool about it. They, they have these, what they call SNICs, Shugati, Naclite, and Ch Chasigne. And these are, um, and these are meteorites that have been confirmed to originate from the planet Mars. They're young in age, 1.3 billion years, not 4.5 billion. And, and they contain trapped gases of the Martian atmosphere. Okay. And then this is uh, Robert Hake single stone. This is the museum trade. This one came from this piece here. You can see where he cut it, like right down here. Okay. So every Zagami that's out on the meteorite market is from this piece right here, okay?
And uh, what's uh, one thing that bothered me about Sagamis? Look at that. Mars is red. Okay, Mars has a reddish because a rusting of iron oxide on the surface. So why isn't this red? So that bothered me. And then. The Curiosity rovers uh, dug in several, they, in like a dozen places, but this shows one. But just underneath the surface, notice it's this gray color. See? So this is a Martian basalt. And it's not the color that, you know, it's the science. So if you look at the, um, what happened is as this rock was blasted off of Mars, it melted and formed this glass called mescalinite. And this trapped the Martian atmosphere. And this is one of my thin sections here, okay, of Zagami. And I use twist polarizers. See where it's black here and where it's white here? These black areas, those are the mescalinite glass. That glass contains the night. The atmosphere of nitrogen, argon and nitrogen. Isn't that cool? So I have the Martian atmosphere in my house. <laughs> it's really cool, trapped in, in the in the gas of this meteorite. So that, that's that's really something. And this is a scientific one of the first scientific articles to confirm it, and there's many more. Okay, scientific value, moon rocks, okay? Now we have uh, lunar meteorites, and I took this picture of the moon. Um, this is the second one to be found, Dar al Ghani 400 and Northwest Africa 4734. So um, when you look at the moon, when I do outreach, I always tell people, when you look at the moon, you see two things. You see the, the white part and the gray part. The white part is an orthocyte. Okay, the mineral and orthocyte. And these are the lunar highlands, and and this part is basalt from uh, from magma flows. Okay, and that's what you see in here. So this is a polymic and orthocytic lunar highland breccia. So let's break that down. <laughs> so polymic means many many different um, clasts here. See, there's one class. There's another. There's another. Okay, and they're all together. And orthocyte is the white part. I think of it as an office site is white, it rhymes, and then highland breccia, and breccia is all the different parts. And then here, unbreccated lunar basalt, see, and this looks like this. See, that looks very different from that, okay? So that's really cool. And here, I have my collection of uh, lunar meteorites here. Usually, I only can, you usually can only get about a and and I'll talk more about that in a little bit. Um, and then search for the ultimate specimen. If a better specimen comes along, go for it. What happens is this was like my first the yen this one, my favorite meteorites. Then I think I bought this one and then this one. And then I wanted a complete into it. That's an end piece. Then I wanted a complete individual. Then I wanted a really big complete individual. So it just goes on and on. <coughs> and then NWAs stands for Northwest Africa. So in the early 2000s, nomads found tons of rocks in the sands of Northwest Africa in the Sahara Desert. And they classified NWA followed by a number. So NWA 869, okay, is um, the 869 meteorite that was found. And this is a good way to fill in the gaps for rare specimens and all the Mars rocks and lunar rights have been found. And I, and I looked on eBay, and the highest number I've seen, instead of 869, is NWA 13,448. So that means there's been at least 13,448 meteorites found in the Sahara, different meteorites found in the Sahara Desert. Isn't that amazing? I mean, nobody knew about this in the 80s and 90s. They just discovered this about early 2000. And then you could buy meteorites by the lot on eBay. Notice this no, total known weight. Multiply that by two, that's 6,000 pounds. And the point two, probably about 7,000 pounds. So uh, here I bought a one pound, 500 gram lot, 473 grams is a pound, so it's a little over, but 500 gram lot. And I always get sniped $100 for this. And there's 30 pieces in here, okay? So that's how readily available that was. And I only was able to get two lots because everyone sniped 
all the time and it didn't last very long too so and you can get these three meteorites in uh lots and then um and then preserving meteorites this isn't so bad in new england but in florida and in costa rica and if you live in more humid places you you want to preserve them so i purchased these uh beautiful um des professional laboratory desiccators used from ebay so here's my uh here's my um h l here's the ll and enstatites here's the uh <coughs> combinations chondrites these are the achondrites and these are extras of all of these and then this that get a ziploc bag and put it in the ever dry it's only like 20 bucks on amazon <coughs> and you plug it in charge it and then it has an indicator here and it tells you when it's due you just plug it in for about 12 hours and it charges it and uh it's fantastic here it's 18 percent okay so it keeps the meteorite and then there's this sponge here that also emits a vapor that keeps the metal from corroding too. So that that's really good. I just found out about this a few years ago. So that's, and I also collect fossils. So these are Kenimer uh, fish from Wyoming, from the Eocene, and this is some dinosaur um, fossils, eggs and tracks. That's an oreodon from a <laughs> sheep-like mammal from the Eocene from uh, Nebraska. Okay, so preserving irons, you want to use this hops number nine gun oil. It's odorless, doesn't have any petroleum odor at all. It's perfectly clear. So double bag it, put this in a bag, add the oil, and then double bag it. And over time, the oil always finds its way out. I have no idea why. I seal that as best I can. I'll even triple bag it, and the oil will find its way out. So change your oil at least the, uh, every year or so. Um, and this, so this is really great for iron meteorites. Oh, they will rust in Florida and, and even up north because you get just a little humidity there and you'll start seeing rust spots in these, uh, in these uh, windmill stand patterns and it's really bad and it'll like start corroding the whole meteorite. So keep it in this gun oil and then see this I had in gun oil. So see how nice and pristine it looks? That's because I had it in gun oil. So uh let's see another thing is these uh <coughs> membrane boxes a thin thin box that you could put the oil in here and then um it helps preserve them and then notice here tatooine well what do you know about tatooine does that sound familiar Yes, the Star Wars meteorite, that's Luke Skywalker. So Tatooine is an actual place in Tunisia, Africa, and that's where Star Wars was filmed. And there's actually a Diogenite that fell there. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? So this is kind of a neat one to have a Star Wars meteorite. And this, of course, is from Asteroid Vesta, one of the Diogenites. And then I kind of showed this before. You could put a membrane box within a Riker mount displays very well and then uh, we're getting close to the end here so meteorite related uh watch out for this because there's tectites and pactites and shatter cones and sometimes they'll try to trick you and say tectite meteorite or impact meteorite and they're not meteorites so what they are is the earth that's been changed by the impact of a meteorite so indochina it's just, a big meteorite came and splashed up a lot of the the earth and as it fell down it solidified into a glass all right and, and so that's basically tectites and then impactites is similar and this actually has nano diamonds in it and then uh shatter cones sh show shock waves see the shock waves there going through it they're preserved in rock it like melted the rock and the shock wave then solidified so it's it saved that that shock wave that went through the rock. So that's kind of neat. But they're not meteorites. And these usually go for five, ten dollars each. They're very inexpensive. Okay. So don't, you know, get tricked by thinking that these are meteorites because they're not. Okay. And then uh concluding remarks, start with the most reasonably priced available specimens. Find an a a NWA, okay, and then irons 
Campo, um, Sicotia, Lean Canyon, Diablo, Odessa, Gibby, and a good Nantan. These are really available, but these kind of weathered. Um, these are. This is the cheapest uh, stony iron, only five dollars a gram, vodka marito. And if you want to get a lunar meteorite, I just checked this this afternoon. Check out NWA one one two seven three. This lunar meteorite sells for a hundred dollars a gram rather than several hundred to a thousand dollars a gram and they have half gram pieces so you can get a lunar meteorite for 50 bucks okay <laughs> so this is well worth it and you know and most meteorites i've spent you know, around this size i i pay two to three hundred dollars and basically that's an eyepiece or or a a telescope accessory. How many people have paid less than two, three hundred for a telescope accessory? Not very many. Okay, so it's basically the price of eyepieces and telescope accessories. So it's not outrageously priced. And I've been collecting for thirty-five years too. So, so what are you uh, waiting for? Happy hunting! And this is my outreach display that I, I. This is in Howard's museum, Fisher Planetarium. And uh, so th these are the, and usually I bring my uh, big campo, but the museum has 135 pounds, so I didn't bother. And then, uh, and that's it. Any questions? So these are the supermodels of the <laughs> meteoritic world, the palace. So this is the one that's $5 a gram. So this is the most affordable one. So I'll open it up to question. Yeah, thank you, Greg. That uh, this has been a great talk. So we do have a little bit of time for questions. We're running a little late, so we'll give a few minutes for a few questions. Um, if do you have a an email or a website or anything people could send other questions to, or if they have questions about okay, their own meteorite? yeah, everybody, yeah, I, I'm the local meteorite expert, and uh, people send me emails. Send me a photo of your uh, of your. Um, of your meteorite and the description and everything. And I, I can see, you know, and I can send you media, authentic meteorite labs that you can send them to. It's G-S-H-A-N-O-S-A-O-L.com. If you want to know, most meteorites are magnetic. If you put a little nick in them, they'll have, uh, um, they'll have usually um, iron in them. You'll see, you'll see uh, reduced iron metal metallic iron so a lot of them are usually magnetic but the carbonaceous chondrites and the air chondrites are not magnetic so they're not all magnetic okay? so a lot of the stones will tend to be magnetic and uh, they usually feel heavy to the touch and now you know what fusion crust is that's a big deal but a lot of times it'll be better settled yes but you know so look for things like that. Those are the tattletale signs that you may have. I ask a question. Go ask ahead and ask questions, questions. yeah. Hi, um, Greg, thank you. That was wonderful talk. Um, once in a while, I will see a fireball in the sky. And, but you, you don't really know what that is, do you? I mean, could it, could it be a piece of like, space junk or something? Yeah, yeah, it can, and <laughs> and the thing too is it's very deceptive when you look at it in the sky. You say, "Oh my God, that was so close!" It wasn't close. It was hundreds. Of miles. It, if okay. it did drop a meteorite, it will land hundreds of miles from you. So, it, and three quarters of the planet is ocean. So most right. of them fall in the ocean too. You you don't think about that, you know. Most meteorites are found in deserts because deserts preserve. Uh, meteorites very well. They're very dry. Sand mm -hmm. will cover them up, and you know it. It really preserves them well. And another place that preserves them well is Antarctica, but that's inaccessible to people. But mm -hmm. the scientific uh, azimuth, I think the the scientists go every year and collect and collect hundreds of pounds of meteorites on the on the blue ice of Antarctica. Wow. So that yeah, but the, but those are not. They don't put those out for collectors. That's all held in NASA. They're okay, just, thanks. Yeah. Greg? Yeah. Hello? Yeah. Can you hear me? It's Bob Hammond. 
Yeah, I can hear you, Bob. Yeah, hi. I, I got a couple of questions. That was an excellent presentation. Oh, thank you. And I, I don't I don't know too much about meteorites, but I do have this large inherited collection. Yeah. And I have a, you know, one question. Is my dad had a, a fairly good sized piece of the Murchison meteorite. Oh, he did. Wow. And uh, in going through his collection, I noticed it pulverized. So oh. it's mostly dust. Now, how how could that possibly have happened? It was in a, in a couple of layers of baggies. And what can I do to prevent it from uh, deteriorating further? Uh, okay. Um, well, the Murchison is... Um, <laughs> Murchison. It's, um, it's very fragile. And um, I would have dropped this could break and that, that's why it preserves well. And uh, this has what they call a phyllosilicate oh. matrix, which is a fancy term for clay, I call it mud balls, I hate that term. <laughs> but it, it's basically a, a, a clay and clay and with water and humidity and all that, right? What will it do? It'll absorb it, right? And if it should be start uh, expanding, and that's why it pulverized. This is what I said. Remember, get this ever dry here. And, the, and this is a nice desiccant from Amazon. It's only $20. And if you put that right in the thermometer from right. eBay, too, and it'll tell you this is 18% so that really preserves everything. Greg, can send you me, stop, send me, Greg, can you stop sharing, please? Oh, okay. All um, right, please stop sharing. It's on the uh, top. And then we oh, can okay. see you. All right. Oh, okay. Share. Uh, how do I <laughs> stop share? Um, no, it's not. Oh, stop share. Oh, yeah. there we are. Okay. okay. Great. So um, send, send me, take some quick uh, iPhone photos or something and send them to Bob. I like to see them because yeah, well, if you inherited email? a collection, they're authentic with labels. Yeah, so all, I'm it's all, do all documented. I've got a lot of them are uh, about half are tectites. Nope. When my dad oh, was, there, nobody knew what they were, where they came yeah. from, but you actually, uh, if they are from heat from falling meteorites in the area, that uh, is something I don't think anybody knew about 20 years ago. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, originally they, they thought tectites were from the moon, but once we got lunar samples back in '69, that that you know that killed that theory. Yeah. Another question: What uh, as you get older, what do you plan to do with your collection? Are you going to pass it on? Or are you going to try to sell it in total? Or oh, I, I don't know. I, I don't want to think that far ahead. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> I don't know. I haven't really thought about it yet. Yeah, I, I'm, you know, I'm 70 years old. My dad was like, he, he died like almost 20 years ago. But I've got this collection. I just don't know what to do with it, whether to sell it off piecemeal, eBay, start with eBay, or to keep yeah, it. Yeah, start with eBay. Yeah. You, you, know what, you know what's a good thing to do is go to eBay, find what you have. Like, like what, what's a common one? You have Sakodia Lean or something like that? I've got, I, yeah, I've got them from all, all over. I, I yeah. have about 400 uh, all over. All, all, all right. Over. So find out what, what the meteorite is. Go to eBay and find the cost per gram. Divide, you know, I've do you have a, a balance, you, you know, so you can weigh yep. it. And then find right. the cost per gram and see how much they're selling a per gram. And then, you know, you'll know how much yours is worth yeah. on the meteorite market. So if you want to sell it on eBay and stuff, you, you, you're, not, place to start. you're not overselling it. and You're not underselling it. So. Yeah, so I, I could find the competitive price in there, which I think I'll, I'll right. do. Right, competitive, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, then one other question. This is, this is very bizarre, but I, I think I had a meteorite fall on my property. Oh. And this was about this was about twenty years ago, but we I saw this big my wife and actually she saw this big blue ball come out of the sky. It landed between my back of my house and my firewood pile. Yeah. So it wasn't wasn't over and there's a mountain behind my house, so it couldn't have Do been Do you still have it? No, I don't have it. I, I couldn't find it. It happened during oh. a snowstorm. Because I said I take a photo and 
Shut I have up. no idea where it is. I, I went yeah, out there with a, yeah. uh, with a metal detector. I bought a white metal detector. I couldn't. Oh, yeah. I, oh, yeah. I metal no detectors idea. are great. Yeah. For finding. Probably in the ground somewhere. But it was, uh, I saw it driving and then my wife said it landed in the backyard between my house and my woodpile, which is bizarre. I have no idea where it is, though. All right. Any other questions? Or?